do our work. So Bobby Kennedy Jr. pointed out that we should have an emancipation declaration from fossil fuels that's just as strongly rooted in the moral questions as the fight to end slavery was. We should have an abolition of fossil fuels movement that draws some of the same arguments. And we so rarely hear the moral arguments put forward, certainly in the political world, and certainly in Ottawa, in the House of Commons. Uh, I raise these issues. I try, and I raise, thank you. And by the way, petitions are wonderful because I can, I offer, usually I stand to present two petitions a day. I have a tiny quibble with this one. If you cross out, I'm sorry about this. If you want to cross out replacing the Kyoto Protocol with furthering the Kyoto Protocol, I'd be a happier camper, but I present these and other versions of climate change petitions in the House of Commons, and it's very helpful because it means I get a chance to say things like, this is a petition that comes to us through church groups who are fundamentally challenging moral questions. I get to say things like that. But generally speaking, the House of Commons is dominated uh, currently, particularly um, because Stephen Harper has promised Beijing, that, I don't know if you missed this, but he went to China and with hearings underway in Canada, and with a current moratorium against oil tanker traffic on the BC coast, that's a federal provincial agreement that has subsisted since 1972 and been honored by every federal provincial government since 1972 that we won't have oil tankers on the coast of BC because it's quite, quite, quite some of the most treacherous waters on the planet. And you really don't want to have a super tanker the size of the Empire State Building try to chart those waters. But he's gone to China already and told them, we will build it. It's a done deal promised the Chinese government. This is an interesting prospect for us. So the moral questions around the climate crisis, he's also informed uh, the United Nations that we intend to withdraw from the Kyoto Protocol. That's why I like the change to say further the Kyoto Protocol, because I, we also have a petition on the Green Party site to save the Kyoto Protocol. Canada has filed an intent to withdraw. We have not yet officially withdrawn. The intent to withdraw notice takes a year. So Canada is still a party to the Kyoto Protocol and will be until December 2012. Back to my earlier point, you can see why I think it's so important that Stephen Harper be removed as Prime Minister before December. It's very important to stay in Kyoto. Now, just because you may be wondering how might that might be, I'm not suggesting we'll have an election and all of that and the government will fall. I just think we need, in the same way that British Columbians elected Gordon Campbell, with a majority government in the spring of 2010, and he was driven out of office, or spring of 2009, rather, and he was driven out of office in less than a year, and he had a real majority. Uh, we need to remember that <laughs> we federally well, we have the term Peter Russell, who's the uh, University of Toronto professor emeritus of political science, uh, terms what first past the post does when we have a minority of the voters electing a majority government, that's called a false majority. So Gordon Campbell had a real majority, and after the election, which by the way, he only held on to power because he'd introduced the carbon tax, but after the election, he surprised everybody with the HST, and uh, found himself so unpopular that uh, he resigned, and um, he hardly dwells in obscurity. He's the uh, Canadian High Commissioner to the UK, it's a nice place to land if you've been driven out of office, but the point is, it's no longer Premier of British Columbia. I don't know why we should tolerate the idea that Stephen Harper continue as Prime Minister with the litany of things he's done that violate Canada's national interests, but the interests of our own children. I'm not talking about abstract future generations that the seventh gen is thinking to the seven generations as Canadians First Nations do, which makes a lot of sense, it's wonderful. I'm talking about our kids alive today, their opportunities for a decent life are being sabotaged right now by the person occupying 24 Sussex Drive. And I don't happen to think that even his own caucus, I don't think there's any, we'll put it this way, there's 308 members of parliament. There's not anyone as unsuited to be prime minister as the man who currently holds the title. So I think it needs to be, needs to be changed. Anyway, so back to faith in politics and back to miracles. I think that we need to be more courageous 
in speaking to some of the more fundamental realities of why we're here, what we're about as individual souls, as individual people, as collections of people who practice some form of religion, or for that matter, humanists who don't think that religion has any place in our society, but understand that there are ethics and values that require care for each other. In other words, we have to name selfish individualism as a threat to our survival, as the wrong way to organize any society, and as really, I don't want to say anti-Canadian, because that's the kind of reverse jingoism that Harper goes in for, but it really doesn't have a place in the traditions and history of the society in which we live today. Canada is underpinned by, as John Ralston Saul has said, by, uh, through osmosis, a lot of First Nations values, the appreciation for consensus decision making, respect for each other. We are, as Margaret Atwood and others have pointed out over many, many years, influenced by wilderness in a way that other modern industrialized peoples are not. We have a sense of collectivism. There's a reason that Tommy Douglas was chosen by Canadians as the greatest Canadian in history, going back, you know, duking it out with Sir John A. Macdonald and David Suzuki. We didn't have any problem saying the person who's made the biggest difference in the history of this country is the Baptist minister who gave us health care. There's a lot we can say about the deep rooted connection of Canadian culture to compassion, to care for each other, to community values, to building together through protecting our environment and through all of these things being encapsulated in notions of the greatest good for the greatest number, notions that it matters how we take care of our poorest. I was talking to someone in my riding yesterday, uh, um, he's a criminologist and he'd been at a U.S. conference and the topic had come up of prisons and prison reform and all the for-profit prisons in the U.S. and a man who makes his living as a prison contractor in the U.S. said to him, well of course in Canada you don't need to build your prisons as a place to house and feed people because you've got a social safety net there, we don't have it here just as bluntly as that. So, we're a society that has been built on different principles. Nothing wrong with the U.S. We always see Canada in defining ourselves by not like them down south. But there are some very distinct differences that emerge. You can go back and you can find them from uh, de Tocqueville. I mean, you go back and people who visited the nascent U.S. and the nascent Canada hundreds of years ago, and they saw the difference. There is a great, brave individualism, the celebration of the entrepreneur that's part of a U.S. history. And Canadian culture and history has always been much more on the side of, let's take care of each other, let's build a society that's durable, and make sure that we eradicate poverty. Let's make sure that everybody has access to health care. Let's never imagine a Canadian society where our solution to mental health problems and homelessness is to build prisons. The moral voice on these questions needs to be loud and in the middle of the village square. The moral voices must not be marginalized to Saturday or Sunday morning or when on every day you have a Sabbath that says, you're over there, please stay there because we're busy doing the really important things, we're having the economy. What use are you people with your moral harangues? We need the moral voices, church leaders, Islamic leaders, synagogue leaders, we need our rabbis, our bishops our priests, our imams, we need them in the village square and we need them to be loudly saying Canada is about taking care of the poorest and most vulnerable, the widows and the orphans, Canada is about taking care of our veterans, Canada is not about selfish individualism. And our commitment to taking care of each other in this country includes that we break our addiction to fossil fuels, that we don't say that all must bow down because mammon requires that you give up your rivers and abandon your coastlines.
We may be a society that believes in God less and worships man and more, but I think the more that you, um, to the extent that I can get away with it in politics, call this all by name, the more that people who are not quite sure what it means to live in a society that appears to be secular but is actually worshiping the economy, the more they can shake off their lethargy, get busy in their own home communities, and decide that we take back the values and the principles that make a country compassionate, that make a community worth living in. And I thank you for inviting me this morning.